today on Beyond Six Seconds. You know when something's wrong, Mm -hmm. you know, like you feel it and you could ignore it and say, oh, it's probably nothing. Or you could err on the side of caution and get an opinion. And if you need to get a second opinion, get a third opinion, because that's what I did. And that's literally what saved my life. Welcome to Beyond Six Seconds, the podcast that goes beyond the six second first impression to share the extraordinary stories and achievements of everyday people. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Tabitha Cavanaugh. Tabitha is a never too young advisory board co-chair and creator of the Strong Ass Mindset hashtag. She's a young onset advocate, patient ally, and colon cancer thriver. She regained her life and found her voice after an unexpected cancer diagnosis at a young age. Life post-cancer led Tabitha to the field of recruiting, where she discovered her passion to help the right people come together for the right opportunities at the right time. Dedicated to assisting others in developing meaningful and intentional mindsets, Tabitha believes we can do anything our minds say we can. Tabitha, welcome to the podcast. Carolyn, thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to have a chat with you today. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you on the show today. So yeah, first to start out, tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing in recruiting right now. Sure. Yeah, I'm just in love with this profession. And it's funny because after my cancer journey, I was looking at life post-cancer and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I fell into recruiting. I always tell people it was an accident, you know, a happy accident. And I recently joined forces with something new. And it's just been an amazing journey. We get to help other people really see their potential. And we get to help our clients work through people strategy to really maximize what they're doing and help them get their desired outcomes. So all in all, it's just a really, really wonderful way for me to fill my cup and fulfill my passion of being a light for people and helping them see their potential and identify how they can move through hard things. So it's it's just been a, a blessing. That's wonderful. And the name of the company that you work for now is called Something New. You said that's yeah. right. Do they do recruitment or do they have other services as well? Yeah, so we have our recruiting side. We're a boutique type agency offering um, some very unique things to help people align their goals with their process. And we also have something called our Something New Labs. And that's less on the recruiting side and more on the, we're going to teach you how to fish not just fish for you. Mm. So we're, it's re- where we really work with organizations and CEOs to make sure that their process is lean, especially in today's competitive market for talent. So we just kind of offer a full life cycle of recruitment and helping people get things back on track where they need to be in terms of talent and onboarding. That sounds like a great suite of services. Very cool. Yeah. So Tabitha, you have an amazing story that has brought you now to the field of recruitment. I'd love to go back a couple of years to the start of where things really started to change in your career and in your life. Maybe take me back to when you were pregnant with your daughter and tell me a little bit about what that was like and what happened shortly after that. Sure. Yeah, I was pregnant in 2015 with my daughter. And actually, then was when I started having symptoms So later realized that I was unknowingly battling colon cancer when I was pregnant with my daughter. Mm -hmm. But I went through that, you know, I, I had my daughter and, but actually rewind a little bit. I got laid off when I was six months pregnant. Wow. And it was crazy. My husband and I had just purchased our first home. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe a month earlier. And I was, you know, almost all the way through my pregnancy I was huge. I mean, I just, my, there was no hiding it. (laughs) Mm. Not that I wanted to, but just people were like, well, maybe you can wear like a shirt that hides it, but it just wasn't happening. And, you know, the second that managers found out that I was pregnant, they were like, well, we'll just, we'll talk when you're not pregnant anymore. (laughs) Mm. So it was crazy. I couldn't find a job. My husband's family at the time owned a gyro restaurant. And I was able to kind of pick up some hours there helping them and also just making a little bit of money on the side, whatever I could do to sort of get through that time. And my daughter was born and it was honestly a blessing in disguise because I was able to spend her first six months at home with her Mm -hmm. and then, you know, proceeded to 
do, I, I started to be a nanny and I was able to bring her to work with me. So I really turned what could have been quite a disaster and a hardship into an amazing two years that I was able to spend with my daughter before I was diagnosed with cancer. Wow. Yeah, I was doing the math in my head because you mentioned that (laughs) when you were pregnant, you started having symptoms, but, you know, obviously not realizing that it was colon cancer. You know, you were very young and, you know, with pregnancy, there were many other things going on, you know, that you were feeling. So you would have no idea would not even occur to think at that age that something like that would be going on. When and how did you finally get the diagnosis of colon cancer? So you're right. When you're pregnant, (laughs) there's a whole slew of crazy things your body does. So I I took notice, but I thought, oh, it's related to my pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So when I was pregnant, I actually didn't say anything to anyone. I just kept it to myself. And after I had my daughter, though, and the symptoms kept coming every so often, they would come and they would go. So again, I wasn't super alarmed, but I was like, hmm, maybe I should start telling my doctor. So I went to my doctor off and on for a year and never once did my doctor suggest a colonoscopy. He just kept telling me, oh, it's probably hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you're a mom. It's normal for you to be tired. It was like a whole slew of excuses and probablys, but those weren't fixing the problem. So that's when I really learned to advocate for myself. And to speak up and to keep fighting, even though I kept getting the same answers like, oh, well, your blood is clear, this and that. And it just was, it was a frustrating time for me, but I knew that something was wrong. So I knew I had to keep at it. And I got married and I was actually in the hospital the week before my wedding with, you know, some severe bleeding. And I took myself to the ER and was having a colonoscopy, you know, three days before my wedding. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, very crazy time, but you know, we had a beautiful day and we kind of just put that to the back of our minds. And I was actually told that the polyp from that they found in the colonoscopy, I was told it was benign, Mm -hmm. which means that it wasn't supposed to be cancer. And then, Mm -hmm. yeah, four months later, I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. Wow. Wow. And what were those early symptoms that you were feeling, you know, two years beforehand, just so people are aware of what can happen? Absolutely. And I want people to be aware of their bodies. You know, I teach people to pay attention to what's going on and to advocate for themselves. And so some of the early symptoms I was having was um, a little bit of blood when I would go to the bathroom. And then it just kind of started to escalate from there. And I, I started getting dizzy. And, you know, there's there's a whole variety of symptoms with colon cancer. But you know, I was dizzy. I was extremely fatigued. I mean, I said, I know I've got a two-year-old at home right now, but I am beyond tired and I never wanted to do anything. I just wanted to like lay on the couch, watch TV and go to bed. That's Mm -hmm. all I wanted to do. And so those were some of the, you know, the early symptoms, nausea. Also, I was very nauseous every single day. And it was just crazy to me for my doctor to look at all of these symptoms and say, well, you know, it's probably hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. And to do nothing further about it. So I would just urge people to pay attention to their bodies. You know, when something's wrong, Mm -hmm. you know, like you feel it and you could ignore it and say, Oh, it's probably nothing. Or you could err on the side of caution and get an opinion. And if you need to get a second opinion, get a third opinion, because that's what I did. And that's literally what saved my life. Yeah, absolutely. So important to advocate for yourself. And it's hard when you have to keep going to, you know, some people may have to go to different doctors and different specialists and may get the same answers over and over again. But, you know, as you said, it's it's critical to keep fighting for your health, especially when you know, as you said, you know, when when something's off and uh, to get the treatment that you need. Absolutely. Wow. So let's see. So you were telling me that three days before your wedding, you got the colonoscopy. They found the polyp. They told you at that time that it was benign. I assume that they, at at first glance or first look, said it was, but I I guess they probably sent it off for testing, which I'm assuming takes a little while for the results to get back. So, you know, you got married. And then how did you get the news that it was actually stage three colon cancer? So that's the crazy part. And this is the part I, I always get a little hesitant to tell because I don't want people to freak out and think that their results aren't correct. But Actually, the colonoscopy results, when they got pathology back from the biopsy, you know, it came back benign. Wow. But it was, I had this big abnormal polyp. So what ended up happening was I needed multiple opinions because I had people telling me crazy things. And 
long story short, I ended up getting referred to a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. And I went to see him and I immediately felt at ease. He actually, he had a Pittsburgh Steelers lanyard around his neck, Mm -hmm. which I'm, you know, I'm not originally from Pittsburgh, but I've lived here for the past six years. And so there was that connection point. And my husband is from the Pittsburgh area. So we felt at ease and we felt comfortable with him immediately. Then it turned out his mom is from the same little town that we're living in right now. Mm. So there were like all these connection points. And he said he wanted to do this procedure where he would start to basically like burn the polyp off and he would do half of it at a time. So half of it, and then six weeks later, do the other half. Well, when I went in for the first half, he got in there and realized that something was wrong. And this was supposed to be a 50 minute, you know, maybe an hour procedure. Mm -hmm. And I woke up maybe six hours later to having had a full, you know, not, I don't know, not full, but to having had a colon resection where they took out eight inches of my colon. And, you know, I was in the hospital for a couple of days before I decided to to jailbreak from that. And uh, <laughs> I'm like, I want to go home. So I'm not going to stay here any longer. Um, but, but yeah, so it was a crazy ride. And then after the surgery, though, you, you know, he didn't tell us it was cancer at that point, because I think he wanted to be sure and wait for the pathology. I really believe, though, that he knew on some level that it was cancer. Mm-hmm. And uh, two weeks later, after my surgery, I got the call and, you know, people are always like, he told you over the phone. Mm. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. well, I basically forced his hand. I'm like, I'm not driving three hours back to the Cleveland clinic just for you to tell me one way or the other. I'm like, just call me and we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. So he did. And I'll never forget that day exactly where I was, exactly how I felt when he said, you know, you have colon cancer. And I said, what stage is it? And he said, stage three. Whoa. And I just, I remember nervously laughing and just saying, Oh, that doesn't sound good. Does it? Mm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was just, it was a whirlwind. Oh my gosh. So yeah. So I guess, where do you go from there? You know, you've had some surgery at that point and when they give you the diagnosis, do you have to go for additional treatments or, or what does life look like uh, shortly after that diagnosis gets uh, delivered? So the diagnosis came and the next two weeks were probably the most difficult two weeks of my life, Mm -hmm. I was waiting. I called an oncologist and found someone to work with, but they couldn't get me in for two weeks. So that two weeks, I'm just sitting there like, okay, I think cancer is just kind of chilling right now, or I don't know what's happening, but this is freaking me out. And, but I just tried to, you know, breathe and think everything through. And I met with my oncologist and then my husband and I were like, you know what, let's take a little trip before chemo starts. We Mm -hmm. knew I was going to have, have to start chemo, but we figured I would have a little bit of time before we started, you know, like a little chemo moon. Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. We got to the oncologist and he said, okay, see you in seven days. You're coming back next week. We're starting chemo. Wow. So yeah, I went through six months of chemo. It was every other week. And it was, for me, it was brutal. Everybody's body handles chemo differently. And every chemo is different, but my colon cancer chemo was just insanely difficult. That was a very, very hard journey for all of us to get through, but we made it through. And I was very blessed to early on learn that this was happening. I felt like it was happening for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what my outcome would be, but I knew that I needed to have something good come from it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really started my journey of developing my mindset and and strengthening that and ultimately came up with the hashtag strong ass mindset, just to to remind people that they can do hard things. And with, with a strong mindset, you really can do anything and overcome anything. Mm, Yeah. Tell me about the hashtag strong ass mindset. Was that something that you were using on different social media platforms to post messages or how did you use that to raise awareness or to reassure people that they could do very difficult things? Yeah. So I, during my cancer journey, I shared a lot on Facebook. I shared my whole journey. I took pictures with every person that came to chemo with me. You know, I had a different person come with me every time. And so I would always post about that I'd post about the good and the bad. And people just really started following the journey. So it came up with a hashtag at that point called save the booty. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. it really caught on and it was great. And I used it for everything. And I still use it now when I talk about my cancer journey. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, I think it was maybe five, six months ago, 
I was on LinkedIn and I was just writing a post and it just came to me and I was like, strong ass mindset. And I thought, you know what? I like that. It just feels very, I don't know. It feels like grit to me. It feels like very uplifting. And I don't know, it just encouraged me. So I decided to make it a hashtag and make it a thing. And, you know, I'm running with it. And I just bought a domain, strongassmindset.com, but there's literally nothing there yet. I haven't (laughs) started the website, but I bought it and I'm taking steps to create something that can really make an impact in people's lives. That's awesome because unfortunately with colon cancer, I imagine that there's a little bit of discomfort talking about that region of the body. But unfortunately, it is something that people need to be aware of. And I think, you know, you don't want people to be nervous or ashamed and have that keep them from seeking help if they're having symptoms. I think strong ass mindset, it's great because it's a great play on words. And it's it's yes. a really perfect, really perfect phrasing. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been fun. And you know what? I It was uncomfortable at first, right? Because I'm talking about things that I don't normally talk about in public. But what I found was that by sharing my story and putting it out there in my authentic way, people felt like a door had opened for them to be able to talk about some of their issues. And I mean, I had friends from high school or even acquaintances from high school that maybe I didn't even know that well, who then were reaching out to me saying, thank you so much for sharing your story. This has been going on with me. What do you think I should do? Mm. And it just became this big platform for me to help other people get comfortable with uncomfortable things. And so that's really my mission right now is to let people know it's okay to talk about these things. We need to talk about them because by not talking about them, nothing's going to change and things aren't going to get better. Yeah, definitely. Raising awareness and opening up that conversation, it saves lives. So that's incredible. Really, really great. And you're also now involved with, you know, we said in your bio that you're on the advisory board of Never Too Young and you're also working with the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Tell me a little bit about the work that you do with those organizations. Yeah, so Never Too Young is a segment of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. And I became involved very early on. I started hanging out in their Facebook group called Blue Hope Nation. Mm -hmm. And now I am not even sure because I'm not actually not on Facebook anymore, but Mm -hmm. I think they've got probably over 15,000 members. And it was a really, really great place. You know, I found myself going there sometimes for advice, but something inside of me felt compelled to share. And so I would share and I would just have people reach out to me and say, hey, you know, the support group is a little bit too much for me, but your story and what you share with us really resonates. And I would love to work with just you. And so I started being a buddy through the Alliance. And also just outside of that, you know, people would contact me and I would just start talking to to like these random strangers. But in the cancer community, when you meet someone, there's almost an immediate bond. And so you just, you don't feel that same stranger, like, you know, TMI, don't talk to somebody about this. It's a very different relationship. And so it was, it was awesome. Just, I met so many amazing people through that. And so then I really started getting involved with the Alliance and I started volunteering for events. And when I was going through chemo, I remember I had had my first chemo. And then a couple of days later, I was volunteering at the Cookies for Chris event that they hold in Pittsburgh in honor of the CEO, Michael Sapienza, his mother, Chris, passed away from colon cancer. And so there was an event here that I started doing. And then there's an Undie run that happens every year in Pittsburgh. And actually, they happen all across the nation. So if anybody's interested, they could look up the Undie run and find one near them. Mm-hmm. But I just really started diving in and it just like filled my heart to really give back because so many people in that position don't have support. Mm-hmm. And I did, I never wanted anyone to feel alone. So I got involved with that. And then I took about a year off. And when I say off, I mean, I got off of social media for the most part. I just really tried to focus on my family and getting back to a good place there because cancer, it has a way of um, causing a lot of stress and, mm-hmm. and, you know, things like that. So Then I got involved about a year after chemo ended with the Never Too Young Advisory Board. And it's a really, really great mission. They're focused on raising awareness in young onset. Believe it or not, I thought I was the exception. And then I was going through everything. And I met 17-year-old girls who had colon cancer. Wow. And it was just really, really eye-opening. So I am on the board now to, you know, make sure I'm out there grassroots efforts on the ground, meeting people, talking to people, raising awareness as much as we can, raising money for all the research that the Alliance helps to support. 
And our mission is to end colon cancer in our lifetime. And I am so dedicated to that. So I'm really, really excited to be partnered with them and just help them with all the things, all their efforts and just stay immersed in the community because I learned that cancer requires community. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very, very difficult to go through cancer or any other major crisis like that on your own. So it's wonderful to be able to build that community and just have people who can relate to what you're going through, I imagine, is a a great comfort and helps you keep a better, more positive mindset as you go through such a challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. So you went through six months of chemo. What happened after that? Did you go into remission or did you have to go through more treatments or what was that like? So luckily, you know, I'm happy to say that I am what they call NED, and that means no evidence of disease. Mm. So that's just a, it was a huge weight to get my scan and for them to, you know, not see any cancer. And I've been blessed, you know, right now I'm two plus like two and a half years, almost cancer free. Um, And so I hit my first big milestone, which was two years. Mm -hmm. And the next big milestone will be five years with yes. no reoccurrence. Mm-hmm. So I'm very happy. You know, I go back for checkups and scans and everything. But yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> that's wonderful. Oh, I'm so happy. No, that's great. And I understand that at some point during this journey, you actually, you know, you mentioned you had been laid off before, you know, all of this really started to uh, come to the surface. But I understand, did you go back to work after that? I did. So I ended chemo. I gave myself about a month or so to just kind of enjoy life post chemo. I went on a vacation and just enjoyed my daughter. And anyway, I started looking for a new opportunity and the recruiting position really fell into my lap just through another mom that I know who had posted about it on Facebook Mm -hmm. at the time. So I went for it. I'm like, you know, I always thought about being a recruiter. Let's see what it's all about. And I knew I had transferable skills. So I went for it and I I got the position and spent a year and a half with a really wonderful company learning a lot. And then, you know, we parted ways after, you know, I had gone, I actually went through another major surgery earlier this year and we parted ways right after that. And then I found, literally found something new in something new. (laughs) It's just been wonderful. And it answered all of my questions as to, you know, de- basically developing a strong ass mindset helped me realize that even though my position was being eliminated from my last job, mm-hmm. that I knew something better was coming. I knew that I needed to just be on the lookout and really stay open to opportunities and put myself out there because I knew something better was coming. I knew that this wasn't coming to be another hardship. Mm-hmm. I knew that it was to redirect me because I think I would have stayed there longer than honestly than I should have because I feel like they gave me so much. I learned a ton that I'm able to bring into what I'm doing now. So all around, it was a blessing. Wow. And you actually found the current role that you're in now at Something New pretty quickly after your employment ended with the previous recruiting company. It was was like a month or so, right? Is that correct? Yes, actually. And this is a fun story for people who either don't know much about LinkedIn or maybe they're on, but they're not sure, or they don't know the power of what it can do. But I spent about a year or so really building my network and doing my best to show up and add value to other people Mm -hmm. without asking for anything in return. So I built a really, really great network filled with these amazing people. And when I found out, you know, I came back from my surgery and a week after I came back from my surgery, I found out that my position was being eliminated. And I had about a month's heads up Mm -hmm. from when, you know, my position would be ending. And so I put it out there to a couple of people in a women's group on LinkedIn with the intention to put it out fully public. But what had happened was, I'm going to give a shout out to Suzanne Spainer. She saw my post the next day, the very next day, she tagged me in Scott McGregor's post. Mm -hmm. My current boss, Scott and Jamie, they had posted that they were looking for new recruiters. And she tagged me. I got on the phone with Scott and a week later, I had an offer and I was starting something new. And it was, it happened so fast, but it just showed me the power of my network on LinkedIn and how amazing people are and how they really do show up when you need them. It was an incredible experience. And I just knew right away that that was where I wanted to land. They're very mission driven. We have, you know, a philanthropic side where we give back. We really care about community. It's just, working with people who really, really care about what they're doing 
is so inspiring. That's wonderful. Yeah. And that's so exciting that LinkedIn really came through for you at the time that you were looking for something new to start. And, you know, I think a lot of people who aren't on LinkedIn all the time, like like you and I are, um, <laughs> kind of think of it as somewhere that I go when I'm looking for a job and it will help you find work, but I think not in the way that people think. You don't just go on there when you're looking for something, but it is an amazing way to cultivate relationships over time. I think of all the social media platforms that I use, definitely LinkedIn, I have the most robust network where I feel like I I know the most people. You know, some I've met in person, some I've talked to on the phone. Many have been on this podcast. It's just been wonderful, the amount of uh, sharing and helping that people um, really do try to come on and and add value and help each other as, as much as they can. So it is absolutely a great community. Isn't that so cool? I mean, where else can this happen? I mean, in this day and age with all the social media and all the people scrolling through various platforms and feeling less than, I show up every day to LinkedIn and I am constantly blown away with how people are helping people. And one thing my boss, Jamie, always says is good people know good people. And I have found that 1000% to be true. And it's just so nice when you immerse yourself. And you mentioned something, you hit on a really, really good point is, you know, LinkedIn used to be a job board, essentially, you know, Mm -hmm. it was a place that people only really showed up when they needed something new, a new job. And now it's so much more than that. It really is this, like you said, robust, that's the perfect word. It's a Mm -hmm. robust community filled with so many amazing people who just want to add value. And when you're adding value back and forth like that, it just, I mean, so many good things come from it. So when I kept referring to a surgery I had earlier this year, I had a double mastectomy because I am positive for a genetic mutation. It's called the BRCA1. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling this story now because I had some incredible men and women come together and create a meal calendar for me and my family. So when I went through that surgery and was in all the pain and couldn't work for a month, they were making sure that meals were being sent to our home. So it made it as easy on us as humanly possible. And this all came from women and men that I had never met in person, but we had cultivated such beautiful relationships through LinkedIn and and talked outside of LinkedIn that when the time came, I didn't have to ask. They just showed up wow. and you can hear, I mean, I, I don't have words. I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful and all I can do every day is try to pay it forward because I'll never be able to repay the people that really went the extra mile for me. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's it. It's, you know, it's, it's true. If you do show up and share parts of yourself that are, you know, authentic and genuine and create value for people, which it sounds like you had spent a lot of time doing on LinkedIn. And that's wonderful that people you know, people want to help. They want to return the favor. So it's, it's wonderful that they were able to do that in that way. So gosh, so Tabitha, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about either the work you do at Something New or about the Colorectal Cancer Alliance? Sure. Yeah. So right now, the best place to reach me is probably on LinkedIn. I'm there every day. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you could search me by my name, Tabitha Kavanaugh. You can search my hashtag, one of my few hashtags I use all the time, I use hashtag tab the recruiter. I use hashtag strong ass mindset. And those are probably the best ways to reach me to see previous content and to just start a conversation. And please do if this is resonating with anyone out there listening right now, I, you know, I really do hope that you'll you'll reach out and say hi. And if I can support you through your cancer journey, or someone, you know, if I can send them a card, however, I can, I can help. I just, I want to be the light and I want to help others be the light as well. And so I'm happy to, uh, you know, to strike up conversations and I don't want people to be hesitant about reaching out. Great. Thank you. And I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile and I'll put your hashtags in the show notes of the podcast so that people can have easy reference to them there. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. And so Tabitha, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Thank you so much for being so candid and sharing your story of overcoming these enormous obstacles. And I'm so glad that everything that your your career and your life and your health is is on the up and up. As we close out, is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to know or anything that they can help or support you with? I just want people to know that you can do more than you think you can. And now that I have that expectation of myself, it's actually really cool because I can get excited about my challenges now because I know that something great is going to come out of it. 
So I want to share one of my favorite, favorite, favorite verses. And it doesn't matter if you're religious or not, because it applies to everyone, which is why it's one of my favorites. But it's Ezra 10.4. It's on my LinkedIn. And it says, arise for it is your task and we are with you. Be strong and do it. And that just reminds me to rise up because that's what you need to do in this moment. You need to rise up. And we are with you reminds me to cultivate community and remind people that they're not alone. And then be strong and do it is like, find your grit and go do the damn thing. Mm -hmm. Great words to live by. Wow. Thank you again, Tabitha, for being on my show. Thank you so much, Carolyn. It was awesome talking to you. Thanks for listening to Beyond Six Seconds. Please help us spread the word about this podcast. Share it with a friend. Give us a shout out on your social media or write a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. You can find all of our episodes on our website, www.beyond6seconds.com. Until next time.